Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the MedEd page. This is MSK Case 93. I'm Dr. Omar Awan. I'm a physician and public health contributor for Forbes.com. We have a great case. This is a sagittal T1 and a sagittal T2 fat sat image through the knee, showing some findings. And the high yield question here is, what's the most likely diagnosis? Is this a case of a parosteal osteosarcoma, a periosteal osteosarcoma, a periosteal chondroma, or a periosteal chondrosarcoma. And if you take a look, I want to just show you guys that there is this lobulated, well-delineated lesion within the suprapatellar recess. It's heterogeneously slightly brighter than the muscle on T1, definitely brighter on T2, heterogeneously hyperintense on T2. But an important finding here that I want to show everyone is that there's some saucerization of the cortex here. Do you see that here? So this black dark line here is the cortex of the femur. And again, we're seeing this here, but then here at the lesion, it's saucerized, it becomes a little indistinct, it becomes thinned. And notice also that there's no bone marrow edema in this lesion. And this is involving the distal femoral metaphysis. This is a metaphyseal lesion coming off of the cortex and saucerizing the cortex. So those are all important considerations for this lesion. Of course, this is none other than a periosteal chondroma. And the key here is that it's metaphyseal, it's sort of bright on T2, it's lobulated, like a lot of chondroid tumors are, and there's saucerization of the cortex, and there's no surrounding bone marrow edema. Those are really the key distinguishing features that lead this to a periosteal chondroma. And I'm going to talk about why this is not the other three entities in the differential. But really to understand this, we have to understand that a periosteal chondroma or a juxtacortical chondroma is a benign chondroid tumor. So they produce cartilage. It usually occurs very early in life, in the second to fourth decade of life. And again, these are surface lesions that are typically along the metaphysis of the bone, as it was in this index case, right? This was along the metaphysis of the distal femur. And these usually occur in the femur and the humerus, as in this index case. And an uh, important consideration is that they produce chondroid matrix. So usually rings and arcs, cartilage matrix, and they're lobular and they're very well-defined, kind of ovoid, lobular in shape, and often pretty small. The mean size typically is 2.2 centimeters. And this, I think, was like 2.5 or 2.8 centimeters in size. And usually it results in saucerization of the cortex, right? You know, kind of just, you know, destroying a little bit of the cortex or kind of resulting in an undulating contour of the cortex. Sometimes you can get cortical thickening, periosteal reaction, but in my experience, we often get saucerization of the cortex in cases of periosteal chondroma. And if we take a look here again, I just want to show this because I think it's a really important finding. The cortex is nice and thick and straight, but then as we get to the lesion, it becomes thin and saucerized, right? It becomes a little ill-defined, maybe an undulating contour to both the cortex. You can see it very well here on the T2. You know, very undulating contour, saucerization of this cortex here. And again, no surrounding bone marrow edema. So typically on MRI, you're, it's going to be iso intense to low signal compared to muscle on T1. In this case, it's actually slightly brighter, but definitely on T2, usually heterogeneously bright on T2. Sometimes it can be very bright on T2 because chondroid tumors can often be bright on T2. Often there's heterogeneous enhancement if we gave a post contrast image. Now, in terms of the differential and the reason why it's not these other entities, so parosteal osteosarcoma and periosteal osteosarcoma are bone-forming tumors. They're not going to result in chondroid matrix mineralization. It results in osteoid matrix mineralization. So you'll often get fluffy new bone formation. That will often be dark on both T1 and T2 because of the bone content, okay? And a parosteal osteosarcoma is also usually metaphyseal, also in the second to fourth decade of life, but there will be osteoid matrix mineralization, often exuberant, fluffy, new bone formation, right? Not as well-defined as you saw in this periosteal chondroma. However, a periosteal osteosarcoma is usually diaphyseal. That's one thing that differentiates it from a periosteal chondroma, which is metaphyseal. These are usually diaphyseal, also occur kind of young, 10 to 25 years of age. And of course, MRI will not show a lobulated lesion that's producing cartilage, right? A periosteal osteosarcoma will often be much more ill-defined, will certainly not be lobulated and well-defined, and will often have some osteoid mineralization. And a periosteal chondrosarcoma, which is a malignant counterpart to the periosteal chondroma, meaning this is a malignant chondroid tumor, yes, it will produce cartilage, but this often occurs later in life, in the third to sixth decade of life, and the mean size is usually more 
than five centimeters. In our case, you know, 2.2 centimeters was the mean size, right? So these are the differences of why our index case was a periosteal chondroma. Thank you so much for your attention. Please subscribe to the MedEd page. Please like this video. Please support our mission in, you know, furthering free knowledge to the world. And we'll see you next time for another high yield MSK unknown case.